Welcome to the Grow Your Law Firm podcast, brought to you by PILMA. This podcast helps lead lawyers to more growth, profit, and freedom. Here is your legal marketing expert and host, Ken Hardison. Well, hello, everyone. This is Ken Hardison, and welcome to another episode of Grow Your Law Firm. And this week, we have Chris Hurley, a personal injury attorney from Boston. Chris, welcome aboard, my friend. Thank you so much, Ken. Really thankful for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, Chris has got an interesting story. He is, uh, I got to know a lot more about him in the last several months because he joined the Pilma Mastermind, and we were in uh, San Diego, and uh, got to hear a lot about his firm, and I said, uh, I'd like for you to be on our podcast and share with our our listeners and viewers out there. So thank you for uh, for doing this. Thank you so much, Ken. It means a lot, seriously. So I wanted to ask you, you know, I, I'm not going to do a big introduction. I know you got a good story. I've read your bio. So tell us, how did you get into personal injury law? Tell us your, your background, how you grew up. Because things like me, you were a hard worker and I appreciate that because I had to do the same thing. So I, I understand where you're coming from. I appreciate that, Ken. So my story, um, I kind of had an unusual childhood. My, so I really just grew up with my mother. My father was a really successful, uh, what's called a headhunter or an executive search consultant. He had this really exploding uh, office in, in Manhattan. He was really doing well. He was just killing it financially but he was getting deeper into his alcohol addiction. And I mean like major league type addiction. And so I didn't really have a father figure growing up and I saw his demise. I saw his, ultimately he was panhandling on the streets of New York city. I'm talking, you know, he went from the heights of New York city and skyscrapers to literally the bottom of the street. And so I had this sort of I guess like a chip on my shoulder. Like I wasn't born wealthy. I wasn't born with, with a lot. So my mom sort of took me under her wing and raised me alone, just me and her, and gave me a really good educational springboard. And in elementary school, I was just really messing around, getting into trouble. I mean, I was really on a path of failure. So when I hit high school, I started to kind of work hard, like really hard. And I discovered I'm kind of just a grinder, a worker bee, right? So I really bust my butt in high school and then college worked my tail off, got into law school, and really worked in law school. So when I got out of law school in 2004, Ken, I, I couldn't find a job, right? I didn't have any connections. I didn't have any, anything really at my disposal. So I had to sort of make things happen. So I, I met this kind older lawyer in the Boston area. And we started kind of this partnership with just me and him. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I barely even knew you know, anything about personal injury, but I realized that there was an opening to make money in that space. And I liked it. I liked that I didn't have to work crazy billable hours, I could break, you know, contingent fee income. And so he and I had a, had a partnership, but it sort of fizzled out. And he and I kind of parted like gentlemen. So I just hung up my shingle and just sort of just, I'm very kind of risk tolerant. And I just said, let's let this baby fly and go for it. You know, Boston's really competitive, but I just, I, something in me is okay with taking on risk. I think you can relate, Ken. I think you're, you're a risk taker too. And uh, you bet on yourself. I put big bets on myself. And that's kind of sort of how I hit this space of, of doing personal injury work in general. But my backstory really fuels my, it gives me motivation because my father couldn't succeed. He wasn't able to because of his addiction. And so I feel this calling to do the best that I can with what I've got and to just do, do everything I possibly can to make a good living for myself and my family. So when you left this this lawyer and started your own practice, you know, I, I did. I had the kind of the same scenario. It's kind of parallel lives. I uh, I went and worked with a law firm and didn't last three months and, and quit. And then went and just hung out my shingle went in the office of an old lawyer that was pretty much on his way out. I mean, he was eighty years old, and so I pretty much got it just the office space and, and got you know he had the chairs and the desk and all that. But uh, I mean, you you starting out. I guess you got very few clients. What did you do? How did you start getting business? Sure. So I, um, for many, many years, I was sort of, I was doing okay, but it was just primarily me and an assistant and the money was good, but I saw there was sort of a ceiling on that. 
and I was very close minded looking back. I wasn't looking at things from a very, from a very wide enough view. And I basically was flatlining. The money was good, right? It was a comfortable life, but I wanted more. So fast forward, I've been at this about 17 years, but fast forward to about three or four years ago when I sort of had a, a pivot, it, a realization that I'm definitely not the most talented trial lawyer, but I think I have a decent sense on entrepreneurial things that you need to do to make money, right? So I'm more the business mind guy as opposed to the litigator mind type of person. And so I really, I joined Pilma, right? Eventually got into the mastermind. I, I met another mastermind and I also have two coaches. So I'm really into personal development as a businessman. And I know you know the book very well, Michael Gerber, The E-Myth, that, you know, I know you've spoken about that. It's instrumental and very influential on you. It's been very influential on me. That's what I'm trying to get to. So basically, a few years ago, I decided to scale and take, you know, big bets and sort of go for it. Because I saw a lot of firms were pulling back when the pandemic hit. I saw an opening to potentially prosper. So I just hired a bunch of people, like eight people. I doubled my office space here in downtown Boston, I took on a lot of office space when people were really, you know, were betting on a virtual work environment being the, the new norm. So I saw a cost savings there and, and an opportunity. And so, you know, following your advice, I systematized everything I possibly could, right? Anything we do should be systematized. And, you know, like you, I'm obsessed with client service. Like I am really obsessed with making sure the client has the best possible experience we can deliver. And so I'm a believer that, you know, eventually this is going to pop because I know there's sort of enough pressure on this thing, right? In, in terms of just all this work and education and intention that I believe is just going to pop. But right now I'm in a real growth phase. Like I'm sure a lot of people on this call can are growing. They're making big bets themselves or spending money and it's, it's not for the faint of heart, right? But that is the goal is that this will scale to large, uh, to a very, um, big firm where I am simply the, um, the CEO, right? And that's, that's really what, what I thrive on. Uh, but like you, I'm just sort of roll up my sleeves and I, I get stuff done. I like to be educate myself on, on new things, new trends, the law is always changing. So with the help of Pilma and my coaching that I receive, um, I'm really trying to, to build something very special and unique because I think in the legal space, there's a lot of people doing a lot of the same stuff, but if you can stand out, be different in your marketing, your client service, and especially how you treat your staff, Ken, I think you can really build a successful, real culture-oriented business. And that's really, you know, what I have my, my sights on. There's a lot of good things that our listeners can take from this. And, and number one is, is that you don't have to be the best trial lawyer in the world to have a great business. I never thought I was a great trial lawyer. I was adequate. I mean, I could, I tried a bunch of cases, but was I uh, F. Lee Bailey or you know, a near guy that's getting multi-billion dollar verdicts? No, but you can hire people that are good trial lawyers or you can associate really good trial lawyers. And that's what I did. I hired, and that's, and we've talked about this before. You want to hire people. Everybody's got strengths. Everybody's got weaknesses. What you want to do is not waste your time on trying to, get better at something that you really are weak at anyway, take what you're good at, what your strength is, and then double down on that and leverage that. And that's what you're doing. And then the second thing that I think we can learn from what you just said was that always invest in yourself. I mean, people, I never played the stock market that much. I just did my RA and my, you know, my 401k, all that. People say, well, you know, I had a lot of lawyer friends. They were all into this, like, you know, and I said, you know what? I'm going to invest in my business because I trust. I know Ken Hardison is going to run it right and we're going to do okay. I don't know about these corporations out there, you know, like uh, Circuit City that went bankrupt and, you know, different ones, you know, Radio Shack, whatever. So I bet on me because I know I'm not going to let myself down, <laughs> you know, and I think that's what you're doing. And, and I, I got to say another thing that come out of this is that, you're a continual learner and that you're getting this coaching and you're doing Pilma, you're doing the masterminds and that what I see of any business people, whether it be lawyers or not lawyers, the people that are thirsting for knowledge, continual learning and, and adapting to the change 
which is another thing you just talked about. When everybody else, you went contrarian. You were adapting to the deal, and you said you saw it as an opportunity where everybody else was chicken little, saying the sky is falling. You looked at it as an opportunity, which I, I admire. So there's a that little thing you just said there is like four great lessons that that our listeners can take from this, uh, Chris. And I have no doubt. I know that you're making a really good living, but you're going to make a really damn good living and probably work half as much in the next 12 to 24 months. I give you. Uh, after listening to you in the masterminds, you know, because we don't know what we don't know and doing the masterminds, getting coaching, you know, uh, things like that is going to do nothing but uh, get you there quicker, you know, because you can do it the old fashioned way, learn by your own mistakes, or you can learn by others' mistakes. And uh, I'd rather, it's a lot cheaper to learn from others' mistakes, I can tell you. I've done it both ways. I've done it both ways. Uh, Growing my practice, there was no pilmas. There was no, I never heard, I didn't even know what a mastermind was. And uh, there was none of this, it wasn't internet. So, you know, there was, knowledge was not that, that easily attainable. Where now it's at your fingertips at, at a cell phone. So what do you think, what are some of the biggest uh, challenges that you're having? Because you're going through this transformation, sounds like to me. What, what's been your biggest challenge and, and what's been your biggest, like, damn, that feels good. All right. So in terms of challenge, you know, you just said a lot, right? A lot of really good stuff that I subscribe to. I think it comes down to people. You can't run a business without the right people. And like you, I'm really choosy and picky, uber picky on who I bring on the bus, right? I need to make sure that they're rock stars, or at least I can coach them up to be a rock star. Because, you know, you run a big firm, you can only go as far as the people that are working with you, right? And they're spending, you know, so much time helping you make money that you need to get people that you can help them to thrive, right? To succeed, to go up in this life. So I'm a big believer, it starts at hiring, right? I'm a big believer in core values. You have a core value sign in the reception area. Every applicant who walks in here, every client walks in here, it's right in the front of their face. They have to see our core values. Because we live by that. So I'm a big core values guy. Weave that into every decision. Because to me, core values is culture. And everything we do is imbued with the culture, the hiring, the firing, the onboarding, um, company meetings. You know, I got the idea of huddles from you. And now I'm a religious, you know, huddle guy. We have huddles um, each morning. And now we have multiple huddles. We're trying to get more specialized, right? Getting on the same page. We have a weekly meeting. I believe in giving shout outs. There's a good book. Um, it's called the two minute manager. It's, it's about catching people doing something right. And I'm a big believer in publicly praising team members when they, when they do something that hits out of the park or really, you know, really performs well. So, you know, we talk so much about the hiring, but then once you're, they're on the bus, you got to make sure that you really nurture them and put conditions in place where they can thrive. Because if they're really good and they're not growing, they're going to leave you. And then what are you left with? You have to start over. And it's so hard, especially in this climate, to hire people. So, you know, I've listened to many of, of your podcasts. And it seems like the most successful guys and gals have built cultures, cultures of success for themselves and for their team. Uh, but like you said, investing in yourself, because that's, you know, you could take a lot of you know, money and put in your bank account. But I'm a big believer in putting it into the business, Right putting it in, into this to, to grow it and see what kind of heights we can reach. But I'm a big believer in giving. I think the most successful people give. You really hear about someone really successful who's cheap, right? So just giving, being generous with your team. If you have, you know, really good staff members, be generous with them. You know, another thing I've learned from you is when you meet with them, you have these meetings, ask them how they're doing. Are they satisfied? Are they content? Are they challenged? Are they miserable? Right? You don't know until you ask these questions, right? But I'm a big believer in the staff. And without them, I'm nothing. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to go out of business tomorrow without them. So, you know, it's all about the team and building something unique. But again, something you, you preach and, and I preach customer service, client service. I mean, really being having the best possible service. That means you get better reviews. That means you get better referrals. Right. And I really believe strongly in marketing. I call it sort of external marketing, right? You got your paid advertising, but I really focus on my former clients and existing clients, your, your tribe, your herd, if you will, right? 
They already know you, like you and trust. You don't have to sell them. They're already sold. They know you're the real deal. So I really doubled down on really focusing on the herd. Um, little things, you know, you've mentioned Valentine's Day cards. I started doing that, right? It shows that you're contacting them, but it also shows you want referrals. I think you have to really ask for referrals. Make it clear, we want referrals. We want your referral. Here's how, here's how you can refer us a case, right? Newsletters, birthday calls, birthday emails, things like that. Just knowing that, remind them that they're in our, you know, I call it the extended family. And we are here for you when you need us, your trusted legal advisor. So they don't go anywhere else. They have no reason to go. And this to me, Ken, is about the culture, not only with the team members, but also with our, with our clients, right? It's a culture. If there's no inconsistencies, and if there is something inconsistent, we're doing something wrong. So to me, culture's the top. It all cascades down with the client's team members. I think that's a good recipe for success, for sure. Yeah, and you told me, I was asking what the things do you do to work on your herd, but you just told us, but I wanted to know more about the call. Do you have that? Do you actually pick up the phone call somebody or do you have it where they have these blast out each month? Um, it just goes to their message and, and it's somebody singing happy birthday. How do you do that? Um, what I was doing for a while, there's a good platform called Loom. You can make a personal video. I can make a quick video. Hey, Ken, it's Chris. Just wanted to say, you know, thinking of you, happy birthday, have a great day. It just sort of takes the birthday telephone call up a notch, more personal with a video. There's a lot of ways to do it. I mean, there's so many ways, but I feel like a lot of people aren't even contacts on their birthday. So the fact that you reach out, even you know, be it email, phone, video, the fact that you reached out and you reach out every year, the client's going to, I mean, love you. There's just no question. But I'm a big newsletter guy too, right? Direct mail, you know, showing up in the mailbox every month. I'm a big believer in an attorney newsletter too, religiously every month, right? Just pumping those out without fail, just getting out the door. This is where we, we talked about systems before, having everything on a system, having the right people to run the systems, right? So your newsletters, they go out, your birthday calls are made, the, the herd isn't going anywhere. But one thing I've learned too, Ken, is you have to be clear that you do want referrals. People assume now they're fine. They don't need referrals or it doesn't even enter their, their brain, right? But you need to really educate and be intentional about, hey, we want your referrals. We're here to help with any type of legal issue. If it's not personal injury, happy to refer you out. But so they have no reason to go anywhere else ever. Well, well that, I say they're your best clients if you refer because you don't have to sell them. They've already been sold for you. And they're usually people aren't going to refer you shitty cases. So, you know, not knowingly. I mean, they might, but they don't know how going to do it knowingly, which is, uh, but I want to get back to the, the lawyer newsletter because you sent me one and I looked at it. I just got it when we got back from San Diego. I was going from, you know, doing all these masterminds. But uh, can you tell our listeners why you do it and what do you put in it? You know, I looked at it. It's very simple. I think I know your purpose, but I want you to tell us why you do it. Sure, Ken. I'm a big Dan Candy guy. And the, the attorney newsletter is sort of written like a Dan Candy type newsletter in a way. And so what I do is, and this stems from the coaching that I've received, one of my coaches encouraged me and pushed me to ask Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly for a column. And I was fortunate to be awarded that column. So each month I write, it's called Early on Practice Management where I just sort of riff on things I've learned and things that I do in my business that I hope, you know, help other lawyers in my community. So Ken, what I do is I take, so it's all about repurposing stuff for me, making things easier, taking that, the submission I sent to Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly, and I'll just simply, that's my cover story for my attorney newsletter. The attorney newsletter is, is in-house. I print it on blue paper so it stands out. I make sure to not put electronic postage, but an actual lick it, stick it stamp. So it increases the open rates, little things like that. And so the newsletter is almost already done. I'll throw in a, a lot of people like statistics. So I'll throw in some you know, lawyer statistics. I feel like my, my tribe of attorneys, referring attorneys will find interesting and useful. I'll put an inspiring quote. It's just one page front and back, blue paper has just hopefully some value and a gentle reminder, or just you know, overt reminder, we want your referrals, obviously. And it's just, I really keep adding on to that list, right? You're on that list. I just put as many lawyers that I would like to work with on that list. So it just, the list is getting massive. And my staff is, you know, trying to keep up with mailing it out. 
but it's cost 50 cents or what a 53 cents to send it to you. And it's already, I already did the work, already wrote the, the content. We're just sort of repurposing it. But that's the attorney newsletter side. Yeah. But the client newsletter, that's a different animal. That's written for, you know, it's got a recipe for my wife. My wife's made Rory. So it's, you know, Rory's recipe. And there's just something about not the law. It almost nothing to do with the law. Right. It's about what my kids are doing. I'm a big coach in my kids' lives. Right. It's about, there's a recipe about what we're doing, the sports my kids are playing, birthdays we celebrate. There's always in that newsletter, you know, a list of people who refer us cases. You know, thank you, John S. or Samantha M. for referring us case, whoever that is. So we give people shout outs referring you cases. Again, we're, we're reaffirming we want your referrals. But newsletters are big, Ken, you know, direct mail. I just, you're showing up differently than everybody else for sure. One other quick thing, I'm sorry. An email blast I find is really effective. A weekly email blast, like without interruption, rhythmically. And to make it interesting, you know, you're going to think about your subject line. We have nice open rates. We're always trying to improve that. If you're not doing it already, send a weekly email out to your, your herd and make it interesting, right? And put video in there and, and give do giveaways. We're giving away two Red Sox tickets. We just gave away some Visa gift cards. Always something to make people want to open it and stay tuned to what we're, what we're doing next. So if you're not already doing an email blast, basically free. I highly encourage it. What do you find your open rates are, Chris? Like mid thirties. That's great. It's good. Sometimes yeah. you hit 40, sometimes it's 30, but I'd say mid 30. I think 20 or anything 20 or above is great. Yeah. And Ken, okay. even if they don't open it, they see your name though, right? Assuming they didn't unsubscribe. So they're seeing your name pop up every week. So just another way to connect. Yeah. I mean, well, what, all this stuff you talk about, the cards, the calls, the newsletters, the emails is top of mind awareness because most lawyers think that people just, because you did something good for them, they're going to remember you forever. And that's just not the truth. I wish it was, but it's not. And, uh, or even if they do remember you, they might not remember it at the time. Somebody said, yeah, I just got in a wreck. I don't know what to do, but it just keeps them on top. You know, I just think it really works well. And, and you know, but I think, what I see lawyers do is they give up too early on the newsletter. It takes about a year to see some traction. So I tell people don't give up on it too quick. You know, sometimes it can take even over a year, but I know it works because I've seen it work. So yeah, I was going to ask you about the article. Yeah. So you, I was asking you why you did the article in the, I saw that you were, you know, in the, and so you write about practice management, which is good because you're getting into all this. And uh, I just think that's wonderful. I think that's smart, smart marketing. And I find, Ken, that that Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly column has been picked up by Rhode Island Lawyers Weekly. I got a lawyer in Minnesota who I guess had hit his Lawyers Weekly in Minnesota asked me about some of the content. So, you know, I'm a big believer, Ken, you have to ask for stuff in this life. You can't be a backseat, you know, passenger. You get, if you want something, ask. The only reason why... I got the column, that column was I asked for it. I also got a column in the ABA and that was because I asked for it, right? Because my coach said, you know, ask for this, go get this. And I asked and they said, yes. Now it's a lot of work. you got to write every month. you got to get creative and think, what are lawyers challenged by? What are problems swirling their heads? What do they want to talk, you know, read about? And so it's, it's hard. Sometimes it's, you really got to think about what am I going to write about? Right, but you try to make. I do know. I do know. I, you know, I have to write one, <laughs> two, write one or two articles every month for the Pilma Insider magazine. Yeah, I just, I just got through one. I said, "Man, and you know, that's twenty four articles a year. It's a lot of articles. That's so much. I think about that when I read your stuff. And man, Ken's pumping out a lot of material. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a really good editor, my wife, and she makes it. Sometimes I can just write an outline, and she'll write it. So that, I get a little help. I'm not going to take all her glory. She, <laughs> Takes she gets, a village. Yeah, because she's a better writer than I am, actually. And she had a better flow. Uh, she's just a better writer. And, uh, she's a lawyer, too, so she understands the deal. Yeah, good deal. So of everything that you uh, tell, let's try this two different ways. I want to ask you two questions. Number one, what would you tell a young lawyer it's either they're starting out in the personal injury practice or is an associate with another firm is thinking about going out on his own. What would you tell him? What would be like, well, I wish somebody told me this, you know, when I left that guy and went out on my own, I wish that somebody told me these one or two or three things. What would you tell them? Build your list. 
and never stop building that lit. That's your most valuable asset, Ken. That's everything you got is your list. People who know you, know you like you and trust you, build that thing out every day. I'm adding on to my, my database every day with lawyers and clients, right? You have to build out that list. Another you know, thing, it sounds daunting for a lot of people, but write a book. It's not, you know, today with today's technology, it's pretty easy to bang out a book. It doesn't have to be uh, war and peace, right? I got like four or five books and they're like 60 pages. They're legitimate copyrighted books, but really a lot of it is just, you know, repurposed stuff from my blog post. Again, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Use your assets and then repurpose your assets, these marketing assets. But honestly, Ken, I learned later in the game to build out my list. For a new lawyer or a lawyer looking to make a, a pivot, that list is everything. I feel strongly about that. And if you're already running a practice, you know, get those reviews. Um, I discovered recently, you don't need to have Gmail. Uh, someone does need Gmail to leave your review, which to me is total game changer for review generation. Make sure your staff knows we need reviews. Um, build out those reviews as much as possible. And again, I think it comes back to uh, focus on the client, focus on the client service, give them everything they need. And then some, right. You talk about the doctor of preeminence, right. All about the client. You do that. You're generous with that. I think good things happen always. It does. It does. I mean, if you do that, right. The money will come, the referrals will come. I mean, I, I'm living proof of it. I used to spend seven figures on marketing, but still 42% of my cases came from client referrals and that 42% don't sound like a lot. But it is if you're spending, you know, one point five two million dollars a year on, on TV and radio and billboards and back then yellow pages. Of course, they're not; they're gone. But uh, and this is from Dan Kennedy and, and everybody. I mean, I was a big, big uh, proponent of that. I mean, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit more because I think it's so important. The books, you know, they're great lead magnets. They give you authority. Uh, they're good for people that are on the fence to send to them. I just think it does so many things. You can give them to people to give out to people who've been in car wrecks and say, you know, it gives them an icebreaker to go. It makes it easier for them to refer you. And then you've got the authority or perceived authority from writing the book. So that's just the type of things that I used to use them for. In fact, I used to put them in doctor's offices that would let me, and 50% of them would and 50% of them wouldn't. But, uh, you know, to put them in the lobby uh, of chiropractors and, and neurosurgeons and orthopedics. Some of them, most of them won't let you do it, but some do. What do you do with your books? Do you use them lead magnets or what, what different ways do you use them? Yeah, so we use uh, Infusionsoft slash Keep for a, kind of a, a nice sort of sophisticated um, email sequence, right? So if you raise your hand and you show interest, you're going to be getting some educational materials. I have an ebook going out to you. Uh, we're also going to send you a shock and awe box in the mail, which has the, you know, the actual physical book in it, as well as a, a book on our reviews. Um, just a ton of, you know, merchandise, um, really, again, showing up differently. But the books, you know, when I go to meet lawyers I've met before, I'll bring them, I call it a merch bag, merchandise bag. I have my books in there newsletters, you know, just giving them, because it's hard to throw these things away. I think it's hard to discard some, a book. <laughs> you're probably going to stick around. They're very sticky, right? So you're going to hold on to that. So give them out to, like you did. I mean, give them out to everybody. There's no bad use of a book. Um, spend a few bucks, get them printed, get them printed nicely. So they're high quality and doesn't have to be, again, something fancy. Bang it out, make it nice and leverage the heck out of it for sure. Because you're an author and that's legit. So many ways to use it, you know, and it can actually get you out of a speeding ticket. No, this is a true story. Many years ago, I got pulled by a city cop in my hometown and uh, he pulled me over and he recognized me or whatever. He said, you know what you were going to say? No, he said, well, you're going like 45 and 35. I said, I'm sorry, you know, whatever. And he looks at the back of my seat and I got one of my books. He said, can I have that book? Would you autograph that book for me? <laughs> I said, surely I will do that. And so I autographed it, book, give it to him. He said, well, oh. listen, take it easy, okay? Slow it down. <laughs> so, you know, but the guy had seen it because I had been on TV with it too. I'd offer it on TV once in a while. Uh, not all the time, but, but you know, every once in a while I'd do an ad and, and then he saw the book and wanted uh, me to autograph it. And I'm nobody. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a best-selling author, right? But it's just the power of that being an author. 
I mean, he wanted a copy of it and he won't even a wreck. But that's a nice guy to have my book, right? A cop? Yeah. So it got me out of a speeding ticket and uh, that, that told me something very powerful about a book. And it don't, like you say, it don't have to be war and peace. In fact, Pilmo, you know, we license them out by market, but I still think it's better if you got the time and to do it, to do your own. But most lawyers don't or won't. And so we do that. We got not many lawyers that license them. We got like, I guess, seven books for like what you did. I did a bunch of different books. I did them on property damage. I did them on nursing home, motorcycle, trucking accidents, workers' comp, social security, you know, and, and they work. I mean, they just work. All right. Now, we talked about the young lawyers. What would you just tell all our listeners out there, like one or two things that you think they really should be watching out for in the next couple of years? Well, well I'm definitely no expert whatsoever, but this this metaverse is coming on pretty strong, right? Film has been, film has some material on it. So I think that's something to be, you know, sensitive to that this is probably in the horizon. Let's be mindful of, of this and, and try to try to leverage this. I don't think Google's going anywhere anytime soon. I've read that Google really wants you, Google My Business profile to really almost replace your website. So if you're not already really focused on that, just a little thing we do, Ken, each time that a client comes in to pick up a check, I take a picture with that client and I have a section of my, my website called Raving Fans where we just you know put a photo of me and the client with the check. And then we put that, up, upload that to Google My Business. So you always want to feature Google My Business. So make Google happy, right? There's no hacks here. There's no black hat stuff that works. It's all legit. Do the right thing, right? It's all about the long game, I feel like, with Google. But I think Google My Business is just going to become more and more important. So never, never neglect that. Get as many reviews as you can, right? Reviews are, are essential. Pump out content, right? There's these copywriting software programs that, you know, it can basically write content for you, which is extremely helpful as a leverage point to really bang out a lot of content. But I think this, you know, comes down to no matter what's coming on the horizon, Ken, whatever's in the future, I think you, if you're running a business, it has to be systematized and really, you know, intentional about what we're doing. And again, I think it comes down to the, the people, the culture. I think if you can figure that out, you got something special. I have so much to figure out, Ken. I'm in a real growth phase. So I'm a student. And I know I'm in the right, in the right space with you and Pilma and the mastermind. You know, I'm going to like 12 conferences this year, Ken. Because um, again, I'm at another mastermind. I'm going to New York. and I'm, I'm always traveling like you. Because that's what you need to do to grow and prosper and you know, meet people, yeah. shake hands. I mean, you're always on the road. Why? Well, because you, I, that's how you grow. Yeah. Well, I hope you're coming to the Pilma Summit. I'll be there. I'm going, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've been before, right? I've never, I've never been to the summit. I did the virtual. I've been in for a few years, but this is during the pandemic. So I never went to, uh, to, to yeah. Louisiana, but I'm really excited. I've never been there. So yeah, for our listeners, if you've never been to one, you owe it to yourself. And I'm probably, I give a hundred percent money back guarantee, you know, if you don't like it after the first day. And uh, we got some great speakers going to be there. And uh, after listening to you today, I'm going to have to get you to speak at the next one. Uh, <laughs> and I also want you to, I will take any articles that you want to write for our uh, Pilma Insider Magazine, by the way, also. Appreciate you, Ken. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. We need content. You know, it's like I say, I've been doing two articles a month for 10 years. It's, you know, I'm running out of stuff to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I know. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. So that's why I like the podcast. I mean, it just kind of go with the flow and talk about what's going on. But no, this has been, this has been uh, very entertaining, uh, very informative. And uh, I'm proud of what you're doing. And I've seen nothing but success. And I look forward to seeing you at the summit. For sure. Uh, June 27th through the 29th in the Ritz-Carlton in New Orleans, man. Where else would you want to be? And uh, nice hotel. Got about 26 speakers. Wow. Yeah, and it's going to be fun. Really leading industry and much of lawyers mm -hmm. that have uh, going to show the, share the secrets to their success. They're going to peel back. Uh, we got one uh, that's going to talk about what he did when John Morgan came into his to his market, that, the eight things he did to combat it, and did pretty good with it. So those are the kind of things you want to know, right? For sure. You know, funny story. You've heard me mention this, Ken. I had lunch with John Morgan like six months ago. And again, the only reason why I got into lunch, I asked him, 
And I pestered him and he said, all right, finally, you know, he met with me. And the first thing he did when we sat down, he said, boy, you're persistent. I told my wife that and we thought it was the biggest compliment ever. So, you know, if John Morgan's coming to your town, there's plenty of plenty of cases. It just takes work. I mean, there's there's an abundance, I believe. Right. No need to be scared. Just yeah. make it happen and kick some butt. You get plenty of work. I'm but, always welcome. I always welcome competition. It makes me work harder. For sure. Bring it on. There's, you, know, just, you have to raise up your game then and, and let's, yeah. let's do it. No problem. <laughs> so if anybody wants to talk to you or contact you or refer you a case, how, how can they get up with you, Chris? Yeah. Ken, so I'm going to get my cell phone number. So I want anyone who wants to be on the attorney newsletter list. It's called the Early Examiner. It's monthly, obviously free. I just want to provide value. hope you find it useful. Call me my cell. We'll get you on that. My cell is 617 617- 956-2501. Again, 617-956-2501. Even if you don't want to be on the newsletter, call me. We have a conversation. If you're struggling with something, I'm no means an expert. I know about a thimble's uh, worth full of knowledge, but if I can uh, provide value, then don't hesitate to call me anytime. If you want to see my website, it's www.chrisearly.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-E-A-R-L-E-Y.com. Good deal, Chris. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll see you in New Orleans. And we'll see you guys, listeners out there next week. Until then, this is Ken Hardison, dedicated to your success. You have been listening to the Grow Your Law Firm podcast the podcast that leads lawyers to more growth, profit, and freedom. Go to growyourlawfirm.com to find more ways to market and manage your law firm. Please leave us a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts.